Let's talk to Peter Power, a former senior officer from Scotland Yard, now managing director of Visor Consultants, that's a company which really deals in management of crises. Peter, I mean, what can we, what can we do as a city? What can we do as a people? What are, how are we supposed to behave in future? You can't stop these kind of things, can you? Well, you can reduce the amount of opportunity. Really, we should be thinking about taking some reasonable steps against unreasonable people. I have to say that uh, what Mike Granite said there about being a wake-up call, I'm sorry I don't agree with that. We've had wake-up calls. If this is another wake-up call, something wrong. The alarm's been ringing for many years. People have been saying, get ready for this, it's going to happen, from the Prime Minister downwards. The other thing we should be thinking about is really looking at what you were just talking about. What should we be doing? Certainly when I was at Scotland Yard, and it wasn't all that long ago, we were, we were having events like this probably every week at the height of the IRA campaign. Big difference then, of course, mostly, not always, we had enough warning, mm. although that was a little bit circumspect in some cases. But now we're dealing with people who simply want to have mass, mass casualties. They want no dialogue, no warning. They don't want an agenda and so on. It's, things are a little bit different. Well, indeed, and uh, that's why it's so difficult. So, so what do we do? You can't, I mean, some people just say, look, the best thing to do is just carry on as you were because you can't let bombers um, subjugate you. You can't allow your life to be destroyed by them. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you effectively provide security on an underground system? Well, you're quite right. The security at very best is proportionate. It'll never, ever be absolute. Uh, the thing that concerns me is that what are we doing for the thousands of men and women actually who are in London working? And I say that because at half past nine this morning we were actually running an exercise for th over a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my legs standing upright. Did you get this quite straight? You were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise? Precisely. And it was uh, about half past nine this morning. We planned this for a company and for obvious reasons. I don't want to reveal their name, but they're listening and they'll know it. And we had a room for the crisis managers for the first time they met. And so within five minutes we made a pretty rapid decision. This is the real one. Uh, and so we went through the correct, the correct drills of activating crisis management procedures to jump from slow time to quick time thinking yeah. and so on. Well, that's all very good, slow time to quick time thinking and crisis management procedures, but, you know, if you've just been um, blown up by a bomb on a train, none of that helps very much. I mean, you know, I'll come back to it. I'm the World Conference on Disaster Management. It's the biggest conference on disaster management in the world. Adrian Gordon is the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Emergency Preparedness, and Peter Power is the Managing Director of a consulting firm based in London that specialises in crisis management. Thanks both of you for being here. Peter, let's start with you. Uh, we've heard something quite extraordinary, could be a coincidence or, or not, that your firm on the very day that the bombs went off in London were running an exercise simulating three bombs going off in the very same tube stations that they went on. How did this happen? Coincidence or were you acting on information that you knew? Uh, I don't think we can say that we had some special insight to, to the terrorist network, otherwise I'd be under arrest myself. The truth of it is... But it is a coincidence. It's a coincidence and it's a spooky coincidence. Uh, our scenario was very similar, it wasn't totally identical, but it was based on bombs going off to the time, the location, all this sort of stuff. But it wasn't an accident in the sense that London has a history of bombs. And the reason why our emergency services did so well and prepared probably better than any other city in the world, sadly, they have to be. So it wasn't exactly rocket science or totally out of the pale to come up with that scenario. Unusual though it did, so we had to stop the exercise and go into real time, and it worked very well. Although there was a few seconds when the audience didn't realize whether it was real or not. But in planning a...
with Mark Honigsbaum reporting from the London, the London Hilton Hotel opposite Edgware Road Station where we believe there was an explosion this morning under the carriage of a train. I've been speaking to survivors all morning. Uh, people were evacuated first of all to Marks and Spencers beside the underground and then uh, across the road to the London Hilton where there are some people in very, very bad injuries. There was a woman who got cuts and burns to her face and is being wrapped uh, from head uh, to neck in, in bandages as, as people with blood cuts. But, I mean, the main thing, the main thing is people are extremely shook up still. Um, what seems to have happened is that sometime around 9.30 this morning, passengers uh, in a train from Edgware Road traveling to Paddington, they just left Edgware Road Station when suddenly they felt they had a massive explosion. Uh, and some passengers described how the tiles, the covers, uh, on the floor of the train suddenly flew up, rose up, and the next thing they know, there was another almighty crash, which they now believe was a train traveling in the opposite direction, hitting their... Brewing, actually. Thank you very much. We were offered to, to get a drink. Thank you. Were you in the uh, train when? That was right. The guys at the front of our carriage, the bombs at the rear of the carriage, and just up from us. So we caught all the glass. How did you feel in the train when you were bombed? I didn't feel the pain, the physical pain, to start with. Because you saw, I saw a very bright light, you sort of orangey yellow light and what appeared to be silver sort of lines across which was the glass flying through the air um, and I just remember being turned Service said they've treated 45 patients with serious and critical injuries, burns, amputations and fractured limbs before moving them to the nearest hospital. We just pulled out Edgeway Road and next thing I know there's a, loud, a large flash of light. I uh, felt a burning sensation on my hands, put my hands up to my face.
and stopped at all stations and went to Kingston. Sorry, and went to um, King's Cross. King's Cross, yes. Um, it arrived at 8.43.
a series of coordinated blasts requiring intensive planning. The government's Emergency Cobra Committee, as I said, has been in session. Anti-terrorist officers are leading the investigation. So how prepared were the security services, and do they really have any idea who could have done it? Our Home Affairs correspondent, Simon Israel, has this. There was no intelligence that this was about to happen, according to police and MI5. The threat level was, they say, one down from the highest, reserved for when there's a specific and imminent target. One agency reported that the Israeli embassy in London claimed to have been warned by police only minutes before the first bomb went off, a claim strongly denied by the Metropolitan Police. At a joint press conference of the emergency services this afternoon, senior officers insisted there was no warning. The police service received no warning about these attacks and the police service has received no claims of responsibility from any group in connection with these attacks. In fact, Channel 4 News has learned that Scotland Yard's Security Review Committee met an hour after the attacks to examine if any warnings or signs had been missed and concluded that none had. One source said any early credible intelligence would have certainly prompted a publicity campaign to alert the public to be on the lookout for suspicious packages. But there wasn't one. Um, what is your reaction basically to... Four for five. John Loftus is a terrorism expert and a former prosecutor for the Justice Department. John, good to see you again. So, real quickly here, have you heard anything about this Hassan Hussein who just picked up in Rome? Know that name at all? Yeah, all of these guys seem to be going back to an organization called Al Muhajirun, which means the emigrants. It was the recruiting arm of Al Qaeda in London. They specialized in recruiting kids whose families had emigrated to Britain but who had British passports. And uh, they would use them for terrorist work. So a couple of them now have Somali connections? Yeah, it was not unusual. We, uh, Somalia, Eritrea, the first group, of course, were primarily right. Pakistani. But the, what they had in common was they were all emigrant groups in Britain recruited by this al Muhajirun group. They were headed by, uh, you know, the uh, Captain Hook, right. the uh, Imam in London, the right. Finsbury Mosque, without the arm. He was the head of that organization. Now, his assistant was a guy named Aswat, Harun Rashid Aswat. Aswat, who they right? picked up. Yeah. yeah. Aswat is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From the, on the 7-7 and 721, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheik said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working for the, so he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about Al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an Al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London, uh, not because they were getting Al-Qaeda information, but for appeasement. It was one of those, you leave us alone, we leave you alone kind of things. Well, we let and them so alone too long then. Absolutely. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat, 
Back in 1999, he came to America. The Justice Department wanted to indict him in Seattle because him and his buddy were trying to set up a terrorist training school in Oregon. So they indicted the buddy, right? But why didn't they indict him? Well, it comes out, we've just learned that the headquarters of the U.S. Justice Department ordered the Seattle prosecutors not to touch Aswat. Hello. Now, hold on. Why? And that's, well, apparently Aswat was working for British intelligence. Now, Aswat's boss, the one-armed Captain Hook, he gets indicted two years later. So the guy above him and below him get indicted, but not Aswat. Now, there's a split of opinion within U.S. intelligence. Some people say that the British intelligence fibbed to us. They told us that Aswat was dead, and that's why the New York group dropped the case. That's not what most of the Justice Department thinks. They think that it was just, again, covering up for this very publicly affiliated guy with al Mujahideen. He was a mm -hmm. British intelligence plant. So all of a sudden, he disappears. He's in South Africa. We think he's dead. We don't know he's down there. Last month, the South African Secret Service come across the guy. Yeah, now the CIA he's says, alive. oh, he's alive. Our CIA says, uh, okay, let's arrest him. But the Brits say no again? The Brits say no. Now, the, at this point, two weeks ago, the Brits know that the CIA wants to get a hold of Haroon. So what happens? He takes off again. Goes right to London. He isn't arrested when he lands. He isn't arrested when he leaves. Even though he's on a watch list. He's on the watch list. The only reason he could get away with that was if he was working for British intelligence. He wow. was a wanted man. And then takes off the day before the bombings, as I understand it? Yeah, and goes to Pakistan. The Pakistan, Pakistan is arrested. They jail him. They jail him. They jail him. He's released within 24 hours back to southern Africa, goes through Zimbabwe, and is arrested in Zambia. Trying to now get the, US, wow. the U.S., we're trying to get our hands on this guy. John, hang around. <laughs> I have so many <laughs> questions now. Oh, take a quick this is a here. bad one. Uh, 18 yeah. Sure. 